So I think we're either going to get downside into September when we get a rate cut, or we're going to get the mother of all blow off tops. And I mean, and it's just going to go up 20 or 30% from here over the next six months. Holy Mary, mother of God. Everybody, welcome back to Milkshakes Markets Madness. My name is John Kutsmita. This is Brent Johnson, the man behind the dollar milkshake theory. Every week we come to you to talk about financial markets, the madness of markets, and a little bit of that dollar milkshake theory, with which if you're not familiar with, you can learn more at the top of our playlist on the YouTube channel. There's a start here playlist that combines a number of videos that I think will bring you up to speed so you kind of understand maybe some of the more granular bits we discuss here. Brett, before we get into markets and some of the granular bits that we've seen go on this past week, I have to say, I do like the pink milkshake hoodie. Uh, I need to get one of those <laughs> myself. That's not actually in our merch, but it looks like it, we should add it. Yeah, you know, I met uh, my son's national volleyball championship in Orlando, and it's one of those places where everything's really hot outside, and then you walk inside and they got the air conditioner blasting. And so in the convention center, it's about 60 degrees. And so I had to go buy, uh, uh, the, I was wearing a, a polo, so I had to go buy a hoodie to put on. And I saw this pink one. I was like, that's perfect. <laughs> well, pink was a good choice. You know, the last couple of weeks, we've been doing a lot of uh, rotation in and out of our normal recording studios. I was in the U U.S. for a little bit. Now you've been in and out of hotels. I'm back at the studio. You're in another hotel. We're still managing to get into uh, the recording mode at least once a week. So that is a good thing. Brent, one of the things we should talk about to start things off is the violent is sideways narrative that you kind of coined, I would say, uh, some point in 2022, and it's continued to be the story. No matter how much people want to think they can predict markets, markets always have a, a way of making you, anyone who's trying to do that, look like a fool. And if anything else, no one's really been right or wrong because we keep grinding sideways. And it's certainly been true of the dollar, which everyone thinks um, is always coming to an end and certainly a big part of why we do the show. Share us your thoughts on what you've seen going on in the market, at least this past week, but certainly, man, 2024, is this just the ongoing violently sideways? Well, I guess it kind of depends on which market we're talking about, right? Uh, regarding the dollar, um, if you take out the the move down subsequent to COVID that was, you know, as a result of all the liquidity that was pumped into the market. And if you take out, you know, the six to nine, the six to nine month run it had in 2022, you know, back to its 30 year high, you take those two time periods out and it's really gone sideways for the last five or six, seven years. Um, you know, it's at, uh, I think it's at 104, 105 today. And, you know, for a long time, it's just been bouncing between 100 and 105. Uh, and so a lot of people think that I am always thinking that tomorrow the dollar is going to go to 150 and we're going to have this big explosion. And the, the, the whole milkshake theory is not really the dollar has to go higher. Well, it is. I, I shouldn't say that. The dollar milkshake theory is the dollar going higher and then the ramifications of it going higher. But part of the reason I have pounded the table on it is not so much that I'm absolutely certain it's going to go back to its all-time high. The big reason I've pounded the table on it is to kind of to try to dispel all the nonsense of why it's going to go to 70 in an imminent time frame, you know, because you, you constantly hear all these arguments of why the dollar is going to go down, why the dollar is going to go down, why it's going to re lose reserve currency status, why these other countries are going to stop using it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But despite all of it, I mean, here's the dollar, you know, it's at 104, 105 and, you know, it's, it's, it's up versus most major currencies and, you know, it's up a lot versus a number of minor currencies. And so, you know, maybe the dollar just keeps going sideways for the next four or five years. Maybe the powers that be can just kind of keep kicking this can down the road. What I would say is two things. If we ever break out of this range and it goes down to the downside, all that does is make the problems bigger. The only way the whole dollar situation gets resolved in a final kind of coup de gras is when it goes higher. And that's what I try to warn people about. The disasters that everybody talk about, it's not that doesn't happen when the dollar goes lower. The disasters that everybody always predicts and talks about are when the dollar goes higher. So if you think we're going to have this imminent global catastrophe, that's the dollar going higher, not lower. Um, anyway, with, with, regard to, with regard to equities, violently sideways it again it kind of depends on which equities you're talking about you know the russell 2000 has largely gone sideways for i don't know two or three years now maybe it's up a little bit the dow has largely gone sideways no it's up it, but but it's not up dramatically um you know over the last couple of years the s p's up pretty good 
and the MAG-7 and NASDAQ is up uh, very good. Uh, but that's a very concentrated part of the market, right? So there's parts of the market that are doing this violently sideways. They're, they can't break down and they can't break out. Um, but tech has really been leading the way. And we saw that again this week. Tech has led the way again this week. And we, you know, the thing that I find most interesting, and I know that there's that word again, um, I, I, I say the, the word I say again, and I say interesting a lot. So I'm going to try not to say again and interesting as much as I usually do. <laughs> But that is something that has my attention because, you know, the Russell 2000 is basically flat for the year. Uh, I think the Dow is up two or three, maybe 4% for the year. S&P is probably up eight or 9%. I think the NASDAQ's maybe up 20, um, but the MAG-7 is up like 50, right? So the, you got these major divergences in U.S. equity markets. And, you know, the U.S. equity markets are for the most part outperforming the rest of the world. So I, you know, continue to believe that this is a market that isn't necessarily going to crash. Uh, but I also don't think that we can continue at this rate of growth in 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 just a few sectors without having some kind of a, a correction or some kind of a pause at some point. And you know, again, I always say that I don't know that you I I I don't think that you need to position your portfolio for an absolute disaster crash. But this is the type of environment where you know, the put call ratio is low, volatility is at its all-time low, stop at its all-time high. You know, I feel like these are the times where you at least want to have some cash on the sidelines. You want to have some kind of put protection when you buy it when it's cheap. Uh, you want to have some kind of a plan if things don't go well, because just the time you think that things can't continue to go well or or, or, or can't go bad, that that that's when they do. So, you know, my plan hasn't really changed. You know, we own equities, we own some short-term fixed income, we own gold, uh, but, you know, we're, we're prepared for some kind of a, a higher level of volatility in the second half of the year than we had in the first half of the year. Well, you've said before in these violently sideways markets, it creates a little bit of of a win or something on both sides of the table to flex about or talk about. The bulls have something, the bears have something. Yeah. Um, one of the things I always think is very interesting about how you articulate and conversate with people in the financial world, especially on Twitter, is your ability to have a sense of humor no matter what the circumstances are. And, and I think too often people approach the markets like it's a sports team or a religion, and they get really, really worked up on, on one side of the table and they lose their sense of humor. You know, one of the things that is interesting right now, we've had a very long run up in the cryptocurrency markets, especially in, in Bitcoin. Um, you've argued and, and many have said that it's, it's more of a liquidity play. Now we're starting to see some of the pullback on that. And, you know, the point I made about being emotional and not having a sense of humor. Now people are trying to find a way to justify this pullback. It has something to do a little bit with the Mt. Gox uh, settlements and the distribution of those coins and people selling. But again, if you're able to look at these things objectively and without emotion, you can kind of ride some of these waves, not get into arguments with people on Twitter, whether it's about the Mag7 or, or crypto, or whatever it is. And that's oftentimes, I think, something that people miss about you is that you're not you know, the, you don't have this very particular ideology and a lot of things you talk about with the dollar and where you see markets going are more about creating a theme or storyline to help you stay grounded and not fall in love with one idea. And therefore, you know, when things start to change like they are right now, you can shift your position. And, and it's, I believe it's something you're thinking about doing in the precious metal market, which is something you're very bullish about long term, but you aren't emotional about it. You do have a sense of humor about all these <laughs> shifts and waves. And, and so what are you thinking right now, both across what's going on with Bitcoin, some of the protagonists, antagonists in that space and how they're handling the sell-off and what do you see in terms of the relevance to the precious metals market? Well, yeah, the, the, the thing that struck out to me this week was the fact that, you know, we've had precious, precious metals had a very good week. You know, silver was up four or 5% this week. I think gold was up one or 2%. The miners did pretty well. Um, they're getting pretty close to back where they were in May and early June. Uh, but, it, but, you know, again, we have a divergence here, you know, typically, you know, gold, silver, some of the, you know, the hard assets do really well when there's excess liquidity or when there's a lot of liquidity in the world and, you know, or, or as, as fiat currencies lose value. And, and I think that Bitcoin is probably the best pure play on global liquidity. So, you know, again, it got my attention that in a week where precious metals are doing very well, um, and again, I, I would assume that they were doing mainly well, because I didn't, I didn't see a lot of geopolitical news this week, so I, 
I, I would assume that the that the precious metals were reacting to some liquidity uh, or, or expected further liquidity in the market. But to see Bitcoin fall at the same time that those are doing well, we haven't seen that in a while. Because again, I, th I think Bitcoin is just a pure play on global liquidity. Now, I think the explanation that you know these uh, long-time, I guess, holders, not out of uh, um, not out of choice, but out of necessity, who've been holding Bitcoin because it got stolen from them, and they've seen a subsequent you know 100x move on their position. You know, in many ways, they they the people that have gotten um, the Bitcoin back in this Mount Gox uh, settlement or whatever the right term is. They should probably say a thank you to whoever stole it, right? right? Because <laughs> because if they had not stolen it and and the, and the people had the ability to sell it at, you know, if, if listen, if you bought Bitcoin at five hundred, now I know as soon as I say this, there's going to be eighteen people are going to respond. I had it at five hundred and I still hold it, and I haven't sold a single one. Well, congratulations. You, maybe you are the one person who would actually did do that, but everybody else that says it didn't. Because if you owned a Bitcoin at 500, you sold some of it at 15,000. You probably sold a little bit at 30,000, and you probably sold a bunch at 60,000. Um, so listen, if you if you bought Bitcoin really early and you've never sold it, and you're sitting on hundreds of millions, well, congratulations. But you know, I think one of the hardest things to do is just sit there and hold. And so again, the the people that have been without their Bitcoin for what is it, 10 years now, seven years, eight years since the yeah, whole Mount pretty... Gox things. Yep. You know, they, they kind of had a forced hold or for, forced hodl, I guess is that how you say it. Um, and so oh. now that they're 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 waking up this morning and they have a hundred X on their position. So if that if it is them that are selling, you know, I raise my head. Congratulations to you guys. You, 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 you made your bet. You were forced to hold it for 10 years, but it paid off. And, you know, congratulations. So now you're getting some liquidity in U.S. dollars. Now, isn't that interesting? Why would any but why would anybody want to sell the world's greatest money in, in in exchange for fiat dollars? It's really weird. I don't know why they would do that, but apparently they want to do that. So anyway, that's uh, you know we talked about the divergence in equity markets, but the divergence in crypto and and precious metals this week is uh, something that I had my eyes on. So with the move right now, based on that divergence, um, the liquidity conversation that's been going on for a while because of ongoing tighter monetary policy. There's various other things going on in, in global liquidity markets, which suggests for a lot of people, we should have seen a pullback in equity markets because liquidity is getting tighter. Maybe Bitcoin is, is really ideally positioned to give us that type of indication. Are you seeing anything in the precious metals market with this 4% move, which has you cautious? With the way markets are, I kind of feel like one of two things is going to happen. You know, we we had a pretty low volatility first half. When I sit here and I look at what all we have coming down the pike over the next six months, I have a hard time believing the next six months are as low volatility as the last six months. Now, I can't say that's impossible. It's possible. I just think it's unlikely. And when you typically have a higher level of volatility, you typically have a higher dollar that goes with it. Again, part of the reason I'm bullish on the dollar uh, long term is because every time we've had any kind of crisis at all for the last 25 years, it has coincided with a rising DXY, the dollar rising versus other foreign currencies. So I don't see why it would be different this time. And so if we're going to have a higher level of volatility in the second half of the year than in the first half of the year, I would think that that would mean probably a higher level of DXY than in the first half of the year. And it's not that you can't have a rising DXY with rising gold price. That's one of the things I predicted six or seven years or five years or five, six years ago. And we've seen that start to happen over the last 12 months. So I'm not sitting here and saying just because I think the DXY is going to go higher, gold and silver have to fall. But, you know, back in May, I, I put a put trade on silver. Again, not because I hate silver, but just because all of my things that I uh, were seeing and all the signals that I look at were flashy red. And I wrote a long blog post, or not a blog post, a long Twitter post. You know, you can go find that and read it. Um, because all of the signals were saying sell. And so we bought puts and that trade for it worked out pretty well. Um, and we're, we are now right back to where we were when I did that back in May and early June. And so all the signals are kind of, they're not quite as extreme as they were back then, but they're very close. And so, you know, if, if, if we're higher next week leading into CPI, it, it may be a time to, to, to do a repeat on that trade. And again, it's just a short-term tactical trade. I, I think silver probably has the potential to go to 40, 50, 60 bucks in the years ahead. 
Uh, but I don't think it'll be a straight line. And if we get some volatility and, and you know, we get uh, lesser liquidity, um, I think we probably get volatility in all asset classes, you know, not just uh, gold or silver or Bitcoin, but I think we'd get it in equities too. I kind of feel like what's going to happen is that, you know, maybe we have another couple of weeks of, you know, okay, you know, typically J- July is typically a decent month for markets, or at least the first couple, first few weeks of July are typically pretty good in the markets. Wouldn't surprise me to continue to see some of that, at least heading into CPI next week. But I think, I think between now and the Fed meeting, or certainly between now and the end of August, I think we're going to get enough of volatility that w- I think that they will cut rates in, in September. I don't think they're going to cut rates in at the end of July. And what we you know what we could do is we could have some volatility the second half of July. People would expect, people start to think we're going to get a rate cut. We don't get a rate cut. And then things sell off harder into August when, you know, the really thin markets, people are away on vacation. And then the Fed comes out and cuts in September. That would not surprise me at all. And, you know, that would perhaps, you know, maybe that that would be what we need and then to then rally into the end of the year. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't think we can just grind higher into the end of the year. Again, we can. I just, I think that's unlikely. So I think we're either going to get downside into September when we get a rate cut or, we're going to get the mother of all blow off tops. And I mean, and it is just going to go up 20 or 30% from here over the next six months. Now I'm not predicting that I'm not, I, that is not my base case, but I think it's either or, I mean, I, I don't think we just grind sideways or up five or 10% in equities over the next three, four, five months. I think we're either going to get a really big move higher or we're going to get a, you know, kind of a hard correction lower and, and, and probably before the election. Well, look, we're 15 minutes in here. Um, I want everyone to know, don't worry. You probably already realize at this point, I'm not putting up an, an again counter on Brent. It's more of just an inside joke to tease <laughs> how many, him. How many, are, how many are we up to? I don't know, but I think we surpassed last week already. It's no big deal. It's just, it, I, I kind of interluded the, the joke about having a sense of humor in this episode because a lot of people, for some reason, got triggered about our little inside joke and having the again counter. But let's talk about markets moving on expectations. And before we get into non-farm payroll, and next week's CPI, I I wanna introduce an idea here, which potentially could kind of play into that conversation. You know, we had last week uh, a very ridiculous debate between uh, Biden and Trump, ridiculous on both sides, but what was probably the most ridiculous part is anyone who was approaching this election with as much of an unbiased perspective as you could, could clearly see, see Biden for a very long time, was just not cognitively there. That was on full display this time. And so then all kinds of conversations came out about, well, what are the Democrats going to do? Clearly, Biden's not in in a place to continue to run. But if they come out too aggressively and say that, it basically makes them a bunch of liars and gaslighters. Um, One of the things I thought about, which would be very interesting, we, we don't know what he's going to do. There seems to be a lot of power struggles behind the curtains between those people who are afraid they're going to be losing their power in Congress if he continues to run, and obviously the Biden family and anyone else who benefits from him continuing to run, arguing and fighting over what he's going to do. But one of the things you've talked about for quite some time is going into the end of this year, expected immense volatility. No side is going to agree to the other person. But what if, here's a hypothetical, what if the greatest gift Biden has given to us is if he does continue to run, his situation is so clearly um, poor as far as cognitive and his ability to actually run this country, but he goes past the Rubicon. There's no way he can pull out without, you know, more or less forfeiting some of these other states that you can't switch a, a candidate this late into the cycle. So he takes us into the November elections so poorly suited to be the actual um, competitor to someone like Trump that it's almost like a handoff to Trump. And the volatility is not there. Like if you are someone where you go into this election, it's two viable candidates, whether you like them or not, and it goes to a vote and it's very, very close to your point, neither side's going to accept it. But if Biden continues and people really just lose faith in him as a viable candidate and Trump has some form of a landslide, whether you like him or not, and people have to make a legitimate decision at this point, do you think that ends up setting us up for um, kind of a, a sucking out of that volatility? Do we kind of roll into the end of the year in a much more calm situation? And how do you think markets continue to price this unknown of, of Biden when economic data is starting to cool down at the same time? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think 
part of the theory that the other side won't accept the you know le- legitimacy of the election is the fact that both candidates would be healthy going into it and you know both sides would be feeling good about their candidate if biden is still the candidate you know and is clearly just continuing to to to, to get worse which even you know the most staunch supporters of his have started to to admit then that does change things a little bit it, it, and may, maybe that would be a way to hand off and get through an election without having the whole republic come down you know to a to a to just a disaster scenario um I do kind of feel like in order for us to continue up over the next couple of years, you know, Mark, again, I, I've said this many, I just said again, again. It's all right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now you got me, now you got me paranoid. Know, sorry. About it. It's more, it's just uh, supposed to be, you know, like a fun yeah, little poke yeah, and now yeah, you're yeah. subconscious. Yeah. So I've said many times that markets don't go in a straight light. Even if you get the most massive bull market in history, again, if, look at the last 20 years of the equity market. If you look at the last 20 years of the equity market, that's a hell of a bull market. But there were really hard pullbacks along the way, right? Markets just don't go in a straight line. They, 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 you know, they run higher than they think they should. They pull back further than you think they should. And then they make a run again when you don't think there's any way they can possibly ever go higher again. But they don't just continually go in a straight line. And the more they do go in a straight line, the harder they correct when they do correct. So I kind of feel like because we've had such a, you know, pretty good run, especially in tech. You know, again, we've talked about, you know, the the broader markets haven't had this big slingshot higher, but technology has had a really high slingshot higher. I kind of feel like for that to continue, we need to have a little bit of the air let out of the bubble and or, or the balloon. And if you don't let a little bit of the air out of it, then it's going to totally pop. And there's a lot of people who believe we are past the point of being able to let a little air out. I actually believe that we can let a little bit of air out and then go higher over the next couple of years. But there's a lot of very smart, very, uh, you know, well-spoken and well thought of uh, people who think that we are past the point of being able to let a little bit of the air out. And the only thing that we can have now is a spectacular crash. So I, I'm not quite in their camp, but I do think we need to have some volatility in order to kind of reset expectations a little bit to then provide the fuel to then move higher. And that's kind of why I, I, I don't, think that we can go with another six months without some letting some air out of that bubble or, or out of that balloon. And that's kind of why I think we're probably going to have some here in the next couple of months. And if you look historically, you know, the fall, you know, third quarter is often, or I guess it's like September, October timeframe. So end of third quarter, beginning of fourth quarter is often for whatever reason throughout history where you get these like mini crashes or disasters or crises. Um, and so I, I think it, I, to me, it'd be pretty surprising if we make it all the way to the election without some kind of volatility before then. Again, I, I think August and September were both to be volatile. Um, that, that's kind of my base case. Um, and maybe though, maybe if we had that volatility and then, you know, what you suggest happens, that would allow us to then, you know, Trump comes in and is business friendly and, you know, deregulate some markets and you know, probably cuts interest rates and, I'm sure we'll spend a heck of a lot of money and, you know, that gooses the economy for another year or two. Um, so, yeah, that's an interesting thing to think about. So non-farm payroll uh, was, let's call it, I guess, soft. I mean, their unemployment ticked up slightly. There was big revisions to the previous two months, slightly beat expectations on current job ads. There's this ongoing divergence between the establishment survey and the household survey. I don't think there's anything there that, really moves markets either way. It's kind of like the non-farm payroll version of violently sideways. Uh, what did you think about the employment report and what are your thoughts going into CPI next week? And then we can wrap up. Yeah, I, I, I didn't think today would be too crazy. Um, it was pretty quiet. I get tech, tech did really well. It, it, it's kind of surprising to me that NVIDIA was down on the day, but yet tech was up almost 1% or the NASDAQ was up almost 1% and some of the other chips were up. Um, but again, the Dow was basically flat. The Russell 2000 was basically flat. So, you know, the jobs number was kind of a meh, you know, and, you know, the economy kind of, again, again, the economy, <laughs> the economy, t- it, <laughs> it's funny. I can't stop my, I can't stop myself from saying it, but I can, I catch it now every time I do. Um, there you go. We'll get you, we'll get you there. Brent. We'll the, get, you'll be, you'll be running for president soon enough. 
<laughs> yeah, the, you know, the economy <laughs> continues to kind of show signs of softening, which is what the Fed wants to see. Is they they think as the as the economy softens a little bit, then inflation comes down, and then they'll eventually have to cut rates. Um, but the top line continues to exceed. But you know, I and to me, it's just more of the same. We've seen this a lot this year, where the headline number comes in and beats expectations, but then the revisions take it all away. Right? There's been a number of times, ta- even with inflation, if some of the inflation data. You know, people have been expecting inflation to come in weak. It comes in at or beats, but then the revisions are are are, are lower, and so you kind of get these these knee jerk initial reactions where it jumps one way and then immediately goes the other. Um, so, you know, to me, it was kind of nothing. I don't think we're gonna have a huge. Uh, I, I think next week will be interesting with the with the CPI. That has the CPI until the Fed meeting is probably the last big data release. And the Fed, I can't remember, is the Fed meeting in the last week in July or first week of August, but it's a couple of weeks away. You know, the, the one thing that we didn't really talk about, what was more interesting to me this week, more than NFP, was uh, the the minutes. The Fed minutes came out. It came out after the market closed. So the market closed early on Wednesday. Typically, the, the, the Fed minutes come out when there's still a couple hours left to go in the market. But because it was uh, July 3rd, they came out after the market closed early on July 3rd. The minutes came out after and you know the they were they weren't super hawkish, but I think they were more hawkish than dovish. And, and you know, uh, I think all the respondents had said that they expected that they would have to wait longer before cutting rates, and they would need to see more softening in the economy before it was time to to move towards easy monetary policy. So I thought they were a little bit more hawkish um, than maybe some people expected. But because the markets were closed, we didn't really see what the what how they reacted to it. And then before markets open today, we had no informed payrolls come out. And so, you know, again, the CPI this week will be, I mean, here's the thing is when, when these, all these signals I look at, when sentiment is super high, when relative strength is super high, when the put call ratio is really low, when VIX is at its all time low and we're in summer kind of thin markets, you know, people are going to start going on vacation. It's July, July and August are typically thinner markets because you know, people aren't around as much. And so, you know, you don't need to have that in that type of a market when everything is kind of priced to perfection and there is no risk to be seen. It doesn't take that much risk showing up to cause a big move in markets. And so, again, you know, you just have to kind of be ready for anything at this point. I, I don't think you can plan on a second half as good as the first half, but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to go hide in the cave either. All right, let's bring it uh, full circle or put some of these pieces together. You you talked about this balloon in tech and really just equity markets and risk assets overall. It, it, it feels very inflated. There's a lot of pressure. We don't want to see it pop. Need to take some air out of that. The ongoing economic data coming in slightly cooler uh, could potentially help with that, right? The, the market can take a breath, uh, step back from some of that euphoria, so that could help in the longer run if we are going to see a good, solid, healthy uptrend or even just a blow off top that you know really accelerates. There needs to be a step back to get some of that momentum again. But you've also talked about maybe it's just you know a, a token rate cut to stick the feather in their cap that the Fed would potentially do a 25 basis point overnight lending rate reduction in September. Do you think that negates some of that p- potential air out of the balloon, or is that part of the air out of the balloon process? Maybe a little bit of both. Again, I don't think that they will. Do, if if markets are just going to continue to do what they would have done, I don't think that they will cut in September. But because I think we're at a level where we're going to have, I, I think we are going to have some pullback or at least some slowdown a little bit between them. Then I think that they are likely to cut. Um, and I think some volatility gives them the cover to do that. And then I think they can do it and say, hey, we did it. We weren't wrong that the next move was going to be a cut. And actually, I think that would be the best thing for the market. So I think if we get a blow off top from here, because remember, my base case is not that we're going to have one of these you know, magnificent crashes and bear markets that last for two or three years. I don't think we're going to have another global financial crisis over the next six months. I can't rule it out. That's not my base case. What I do think, though, is I think we could get a correction that lasted six months, and then we, you know, back off to the races again. Um, and so I think the best thing for 
my base case would be some kind of a correction. Again, I, th I think we need that in order to not have the big bear market being the super crash, right? The super crash that so many people are predicting. If we get the blow off top from here, then I think that becomes more likely. Um, and so, gosh, I mean, some people say we've already had, I mean, we're, you, you could argue that we're in the blow off top and that is why you're seeing the mag seven doing what it's, it's doing while the Russell 2000 is going sideways. Um, you know, again, I think that, uh, I think that when the crisis happens, whatever the next crisis is, whenever the next crisis comes, I think it's going to be at the sovereign level. And I think when sovereign bonds starts to get rejected, I think the money that flows out of sovereign bonds will flow into U.S. equities. And I think that actually pushes them higher than many people believe. But I don't think that that happens without a correction first. Well, like we talked about earlier in this conversation, you don't, don't get too married to your views. Try to find a sense of humor. We're seeing you know, things becoming more uncertain, which is another version of volatility. In those environments, you got to find a way to keep a cool head. And sometimes it's you know the best way to do that is being willing to admit when you're wrong and also laugh about it. So hopefully, you know, with these conversations, that's some of the grounded voices that we're, we're hoping to provide is no one knows the future. We're trying to navigate these things day by day, week by week, but do try to approach it with a historical perspective and a fundamental perspective. And at least, you know, take a moment to laugh at yourself once in a while. Anyone who's in the crypto world and has been sitting on Bitcoin, at Mount Gox, it's $500. Congratulations. Uh, feel free to go over to store.milkshakespod.com and buy yourself a Milkshakes Pod <laughs> t-shirt to, to spread the wealth. Brent, um, it sounds like you got a bit of a head cold, so we all appreciate you joining us here. Have fun in Orlando. Good luck with the tournament. And then is there any last words as we continue through this July 4th weekend? No, just everybody enjoy it. You know, it's the summer. You know, we sometimes the markets, people get in the markets, they get really serious and it's kind of, you know, they take to, like you said, you know, they don't have a sense of humor about it. They take things too seriously. You know, we still do live uh, uh, in a beautiful world and go outside and have some fun and enjoy the summer a little bit. Well, there you go, guys. Get some sun, get your vitamin D, come back here for your uh, vitamin M, your milkshakes, vitamins next week. Same time. We appreciate all of you. Join Brent on Twitter at Santiago AU Fund. You can find me there at John Katsmita. This show is on Twitter and on YouTube using the handle Milkshakes Pod. As many of you know from listening to us uh, throughout the last couple of weeks, Brent and I have been rolling out some new projects. Stay tuned for more information on that. We have been working very hard on some uh, new pieces, some new deep dives, new think pieces, and the uh, Milkshakes Markets Masterclass will have some updates and announcements coming soon as well. We appreciate all of you, and we look forward to uh, doing more fun things like I just mentioned very, very soon. All right, we'll see everybody soon. This show is provided for entertainment and informational purposes only. It should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Neither the hosts, guests, nor any funds they may manage intends to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies.